Good evening. My name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to our webinar on Monarch Butterflies with Dr. Karen Oberhauser. She joins us from, Met from Madison. Tonight's event is presented in partnership with the Friends of the Green Bay Trail, a dynamic local group whose logo features a monarch butterfly. Special thanks to Becky Maganuco of the Friends for her initiative with this program. And now I'd like to introduce tonight's presenter. Dr. Karen Oberhauser is a professor of entomology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and she's the former director of the Monarch Lab at the University of Minnesota. She's been the director at the University of Wisconsin Madison Arboretum since 2017, a beautiful place. If you have never had the chance to go there, please do try. In 2013, she was named a champion of change for citizen science by the White House. In addition to authoring many publications in scholarly journals, she is a co-editor of two books published by Cornell Press, The Monarch Butterfly Biology and Conservation and Monarchs in a Changing World Biology and Conservation of an Iconic Butterfly. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Biology from Harvard College, a Bachelor of Science degree in Natural Science Education from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and a PhD in Ecology and Behavioral Biology from the University of Minnesota. Dr. Oberhauser, thank you so much for being with us tonight. You can go ahead. Thank you, Grace. It's great to be here. And thanks to everyone for watching and joining us tonight. Um, I wish that I were there in person. It would be lovely to be able to see all of you, but hopefully you'll have chances to ask all your questions and learn as much as you can about monarchs. Um, I'll be talking about monarchs first and then a little bit about the Arboretum because I know um, having grown up in Wisconsin and lived here much of my life that Green Bay is not very far from Madison. So hopefully you'll be able to come down and visit the Arboretum at some point. All right, so monarch butterflies. Um, I've been studying monarchs since 1985. Um, it's been a wonderful career. I've learned a ton. I still have lots and lots of questions about them. And I love it when people ask me questions that I don't know the answer to. So don't be shy in, in asking your questions. And like Grace said, what I'll do is give a little bit of background on monarch biology, just kind of natural history, and then go more into conservation in the second half of the talk. So I find that it's kind of nice for people to be able to answer or to get their questions answered um, before we move into the details of conservation. So it's kind of divided into a biology part and then a conservation part. And just so I don't run out of time, um, and I have my phone here so I can keep track of how much time has passed, I want to start with um, sort of an acknowledgement of all of the people that I've worked with over the years, because this is not just me who has found out the things that I'll be telling you about today. Um, I spent most of my career at the University of Minnesota, where I had an amazing crew of graduate students and undergraduates and staff working in my lab over all of those years. So the picture on the upper right is my last crew of students um, and staff. And this is just before I left Minnesota, um, just an amazing group. And together we really learned a lot about monarchs. And this is my new academic family on the bottom left, um, the Arboretum staff, which is another wonderful group to work with. We work on um, education and outreach and land care and research. So this is, this is the group um, standing in front of the lilacs this spring on kind of a cold day, getting our picture taken. And finally, a lot of um, people have helped us learn about monarchs. These are citizen scientists from all over North America. And because I'm kind of have family as a theme here, my academic families, these two citizen scientists here are my parents. Um, I grew up in Clintonville, Wisconsin, not too far from Green Bay. When people ask me where I'm from, I say Clintonville, which is if you take a straight line and go from Wausau to Green Bay, Clintonville would be right in the middle of that line. So that's where I grew up. Um, that's This picture was taken close to there. And these are my parents who have been engaged citizen scientists helping study monarchs for a long time. And then many other collaborators that I'm not going to really have time to thank today. 
So starting with monarchs, um, monarchs have an amazingly complex and exciting life history. And I think that's one of the reasons they're so popular among the public is that they're just so interesting because of, of the way they live their lives out there in the world. So I'm going to start by talking about the individual life cycle. That's a life cycle that every single individual monarch goes through, um, if it makes it through the whole life cycle. Um, and it starts out life as an egg. It's an egg for four to five days. There are probably not very many eggs in Wisconsin right now um, because the monarchs that are here right now are not reproductive. We'll talk about that later. Um, the egg is about the size of a pinhead. So monarchs start out life um, as an egg, always on a almost always on a milkweed plant and usually laid on the bottom of a leaf and usually laid one at a time. So this is picture is really upside down, but it just looks weird if I put it the other way. So here's the egg. It has these characteristic ridges on it. Four to five days after it's laid, it hatches into a caterpillar. It's a caterpillar for nine to 13 days, depending on temperature. So this is what you usually see when you look at for a monarch caterpillar. But when it starts out life as a caterpillar, it is small enough to fit inside this egg. So they're very hard to find when they're newly hatched, but this is what they look like when they're about 10 days old. The typical yellow and black and white striped caterpillar. And after that, they become a pupa or a chrysalis. The chrysalis is a little over one inch long, about a, almost one and a half inches long. Um, it's a beautiful sage of monarch. Um, you can see it right here. You can see the wings kind of inside the chrysalis right here. And this picture happens to have an egg on it just for comparison. So this is the beginning stage before it becomes an adult. And this is just before it becomes an adult. And then we have the adult stage, and it's an adult for six or two to six weeks if it doesn't migrate. So if it's a summer butterfly that we see around here in Wisconsin um, in the middle of the summer, it lives two to six weeks, spends most of that time looking for mates and laying eggs and drinking nectar. Um, if it's a monarch that's alive right now as an adult, it's a migratory monarch. And it will live about eight to 10 months. And I'll tell you more about the life of those migratory monarchs. Um, and then the cycle starts again. So the time period, if you add all of these days up, it's about a month from the time an egg is laid until it hatches as a butterfly. It can be longer if it's cool outside, but that's under normal summer conditions. Monarchs as caterpillars eat milkweed. And milkweed is a very um, diverse group. It's, it's mostly um, plants in the same genus, Asclepius. Um, there are over a hundred species of milkweed that are native to North America. And what's interesting about these plants is they contain a toxin called a cardinalide. And these are um, chemicals that make milkweed distasteful to a lot of things that would try to eat it. So depending on what species of milkweed it is, they have varying levels of cardinalides, but these make monarchs somewhat toxic to vertebrate predators like birds, although there are some birds that can eat them. And we've divided them, um, the, this is just a, a smattering of the different milkweed species. And we've divided the country up into different um, regions and assigned each of those regions the, the major milkweed species that grow. We're in the Northeast region of the United States in the blue here on this map. And we have in Wisconsin, we have 12 species of milkweed. And I'm only showing you four of them right here. Um, this one is called whorled milkweed because the leaves grow in whorls on the stem, the really skinny little leaves that look almost like pine needles. This is common milkweed, which is the one that you see most often. This is swamp milkweed, um, or some people call it rose milkweed because they don't think swamp sounds like a very nice name. Um, so this, this is another great one in gardens. It's common in wet areas. This is butterfly weed. So these four are fairly common throughout Wisconsin. 
Um, this is a fun kind of milkweed that is called desert milkweed. This grows in Arizona and a little bit into New Mexico. And what's cool about this one is it's just stems. Um, it, it really doesn't have leaves and the caterpillars eat the stems. Now you might be looking at this and thinking that's not quite a monarch and you're right. It's a queen butterfly caterpillar. Um, it's closely related to a monarch, but it's more common in the southern part, the whole southern part of the United States. We don't have queen butterflies up here. This is green milkweed, Asclepius viridis, which gets a little bit, it's mostly in the south central region, but it, it does get a, a little bit further north into Iowa sometimes and every once in a while um, into the very southern part. There are a few places you can see it in, in Wisconsin. Um, this is showy milkweed, which is a common Western species. So the point is there are lots of them. The leaf shape and the flower color really vary a lot, but the flower shape is the same. It the flowers have the same basic parts throughout the whole group of milkweed plants. So when monarchs are adults, um, they are somewhat sexually dimorphic. That means that the males and females look a little bit different. And if I were in a room, I would have you um, tell me which one of these you think is the male and which you think is the female. So I'll give you a minute to look at them. And I'm sorry that you can't show off your knowledge um, if you do know which is which. But um, now that you've had a chance to look, I'll just tell you that this one is the male on the right. He has these spots on his hind wings, just a kind of a spot where this um, vein is slightly widened. And these are specialized scales on the wings of the male. Um, those aren't found on the wings of the female. The female has slightly, it looks like she has wider veins. She really doesn't have wider veins. She just has more um, darkly pigmented scales around her veins. So you can see that in this picture. And slightly more brown scales mix in with the orange between the veins. So you can kind of see that too, how the male looks brighter. It's just that he doesn't have as many brown scales in here, but they're quite similar. And the adult monarchs will eat nectar from many species of flowers. So if you're trying to attract monarchs to your yard, what you need to do is have flowers that are blooming throughout the spring and summer and, and into the fall. Um, and I sort of picked a few here showing you monarchs on all these species that are kind of covering the gamut from the early spring. This one right here on the lilac is the only one that's not native. Um, I did that on purpose because Lilacs are actually a really great source of nectar for monarchs and a lot of other insects. And often when lilacs are blooming, there aren't a lot of other flowers blooming. So if you're a native plant buff, you don't have to feel badly about having lilacs in your yard because you're doing monarchs and other species a favor. Um, and then as we go, this is um, coneflower, bee balm, kind of getting later in the season, the joe pie weed, a really great nectar source. If you look closely, you'll see a lot of monarchs um, on this picture. Um, this is Black-Eyed Susan. All of the asters are really great. They're just blooming right now. Really wonderful nectar sources for monarchs. And as you can see in this picture, bees as well. And this one is probably the favorite. Um, this is Meadow Blazing Star, a Liatra species. And monarchs just love this. Uh, I have some of this growing in my front yard right in the middle of Madison. And when I come home from work, there are always monarchs on it, um, up to 10 on individual plants. So this is a real favorite and we don't know why, but just is, it's like candy to them. So monarch adults, are not specialists. They'll eat nectar from almost anything. The caterpillars are specialists on milkweed, but there are multiple species of milkweed that they can eat. So what I'm gonna do now is shift gears a little bit. And instead of talking about individual butterflies, I'm gonna talk about them as a big group and what monarchs are doing during different times of the year. And this too, like the, the individuals go through four stages, eggs, caterpillars, pupae, and adults. So do the 
does the whole population of monarchs have four stages? And we're going to start with now, what they're doing now in the middle of September. They are migrating south. And these butterflies are physiologically different from the ones in the summertime. They're in a, a state that we call diapause. And this is just a, a slowing down of their development. So these butterflies look like normal adults. They look like adults in the summer, but if you could peek inside them, they would not have mature reproductive organs. So the females don't have any eggs in their bodies yet. Their ovaries are empty. Um, I've dissected a lot of them. I, I used to study monarch reproduction. So um, this is something that I've learned a lot about over the course of my decades studying monarchs. And the males would have very small undeveloped testes inside them. So they're, they're different on the inside, even though they look the same on the outside. And what they're doing is those butterflies are leaving Wisconsin, um, leaving the whole northern part of their breeding range, and they're starting their journey south. And I'm going to show you a map in a couple minutes of just where they are right now. So they're moving south. They're going to funnel down through Texas, and they're going to get to the central part of Mexico. And this journey takes them well over two months. They started in August and they'll get to these overwintering sites in Mexico in late October or early November. So this is happening all over here from Maine and into Southern Canada and, and South, um, West and South. And there are butterflies that are East of the Appalachian Mountains that we don't know why this happens, but some of them end up in the Florida Peninsula where they join this continuously breeding population of monarchs that's kind of shown in Southern Florida here. But the vast majority of monarchs in North America and the world are following these solid lines going South. Um, there is a fairly distinct population of monarchs that lives West of the Rocky Mountains. And these go to sites along the coast of California, but there is some genetic interchange between these populations. They're, they're very closely related. They're the same species. They're not really genetically differentiated. Um, and that's because the, there are some from Arizona, especially, that have been tagged in the fall and show up in the Mexican overwintering sites. So monarchs from this part of the country sometimes go west to California and sometimes go south to Mexico. So the populations are together. There's, there's some overlap in, in Mexico. So these monarchs fly all the way down. So these are the flight paths of individual monarchs going to the overwintering sites in Mexico. They stay in Mexico. So this is that six to eight months that I was telling you about. They stay in Mexico until about mid-March of next year. So the butterflies that left your yards up in Green Bay are on their way to Mexico. They'll stay there and they'll start back in the middle of March. So the spring migration, the northward migration, starts in Mexico. Um, basically, those butterflies get back to the southeastern quarter of the United States if they're part of this eastern population. And then it's a new generation that goes north in back into this northern breeding range. And a similar thing is happening with the Western population. We don't really know the degree to which butterflies from Mexico go into this Western population. It's really hard to track that. Um, but we think that some of them probably do go back. And we don't know if it's the same ones. It's, it's really, really difficult to tell that. So. They get back here and that new generation will get back here and by they'll get to Madison about May 10th, they'll get to Green Bay about May 20th or so. And then they'll go through two to three generations that don't migrate. They're part of these breeding generations and the population is building up at this time. And then the cycle starts again. They'll head back in fall of 2023. So, the, these monarchs cover a huge, huge area, and it's really difficult to 
count them. But because they overwinter together in these fairly discrete locations, we can estimate the size of the population every year. In Mexico, we measure monarchs in hectares. We measure monarchs by the number of the amount of land that's covered with trees, covered with monarchs. I'll show you a couple pictures of that later. But so we measure monarchs in hectares, um, not acres, because it's in Mexico and they don't measure things in acres, they measure them in hectares. Um, a hectare is about two and a half acres. In California, they actually do count the butterflies. So if we think of what monarchs are doing, so there I just showed you a map without any pictures, but if we look at that same cycle in terms of what monarchs are doing, right now they're migrating south. At nighttime, they don't migrate, so they gather together on trees. We don't know if they're finding each other or if they simply, there are some trees that for some reason they like. Um, this picture is from Texas, it's a mesquite tree. Um, you can, I love this picture because you can see the butterfly flying right onto the branch with its trees, but we can see this up here as well. I see this at the Arboretum um, and they're nectaring along the way. They actually gain weight as they're flying south. So they need a lot of nectar along the way. This is a monarch on ironweed in my yard in Minnesota. Then when they're in Mexico, they basically just hang out. They get to these forests and they just hang in the trees. Every once in a while, you'll see a lot of them fly off the trees into the air when the sun hits them right, but most of the time they're just hanging on. They just, their job in Mexico is to just stay alive until they can migrate back because these butterflies have not reprodu reproduced yet. It's not till the next spring that they'll actually have offspring. So then as they're coming back north, these are the butterflies migrating north again, um, they're basically moving northward with milkweed. So this picture was taken in Oklahoma. This is a little green milkweed plant. And you can see this is a female and she's swinging her abdomen around and touching it to the bottom of this leaf and laying an egg. So she found this little tiny plant in Oklahoma on her way back here. Um, again, they need to nectar when they're coming back. And then when they get up here, for these two to three generations, their, their population is growing. Um, they need lots and lots of milkweed to lay their eggs on. This is a swamp milkweed plant. Um, they, the, the female's laying an egg here. Here's a caterpillar eating. And then again, they need nectar plants. So this is a cycle. This is like a chain. You can think of it like a chain. And we know that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So every single part of this annual cycle has to be intact in order for this migratory phenomenon to continue. But whenever I go to Mexico, which I have many times and look at these butterflies in the trees, because I spend most of my time up here in Wisconsin and Minnesota studying monarchs, I think a lot about what had to happen for each one of these butterflies to get to Mexico. So this is a whole cycle, it all has to be intact, but the life of every single one of those butterflies started on a milkweed plant and most of those milkweeds are in the corn belt in the upper Midwest. So we're sort of the beginning of the whole cycle up here. So we know a lot about monarchs. And one of the reasons that we know so much about monarchs is because so many people are helping us. And I mentioned this in the very beginning, lots and lots of citizen scientists are collecting data on monarchs all over the country. And the point of this slide is not for you to read all of these different, read about all these different programs, just to know that it's a long, long list of people collecting monarchs and they're collecting data or collecting data. Um, they're collecting data across this whole cycle of migrating, arriving in Mexico, migrating in the spring and then breeding and the population expanding. So we have all of these programs going on that are helping us learn about monarchs. And just as examples, I'm gonna highlight two of these. I've bolded them over here. And I've done this because these are programs that we run out of the UW-Madison Arboretum. And there's Journey North and the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Journey North 
is a program where people see monarchs and they report their monarchs to a website. And when I told you I was going to show you where monarchs are right now, I downloaded this map this afternoon. Um, and these are sightings of fall roosting sites. So like that picture that I showed you of all the monarchs gathering in a tree, these are monarch fall roosts. And this is where people have spotted them. So each one of these dots is somebody spotting a, a roosting cluster of monarchs in a tree. And the different colors on the map correspond to different two week time periods. So we're only to here right now, this darker orange color, and we're only two days into this darker color, but we've already gotten some sightings down here in um, Southern Illinois, in Missouri, there's been a sighting. There have been some sightings up here. There, there still will be monarch roosting sites up here. They don't all leave at exactly the same time. But this is what's happening. The monarchs are moving south right now. And this map will expand over the next month or so until they start to arrive in Mexico. In the spring, so this is, we're going back in time here. These are sightings from spring on Journey North. And this is the monarchs moving northward in the spring. And we have the same system here with two week time periods um, with the lighter colors are earlier. And you can see as the monarchs come north, we see more and more spots. And again, this is just a person seeing their first monarch of the year and reporting it to this website. And the dots that have a little white square in them are, um, they've included a photograph of the monarch they saw in that sighting. And you can go to this map in the spring. I love doing this and clicking on these dots and seeing the pictures as I'm waiting for monarchs to come back here into Southern Wisconsin. So you can see, we've seen a lot of, we saw a lot of monarchs, a lot of people reported their first monarch in Wisconsin last spring. And then another more involved project, and I'm mentioning these just because it would be possible for you to get involved with them, um, is called the Monarch Larva Monitoring Pro Project. And this is a program where people set up sites that they go, they, they look at monarchs in any given site. It can be their garden, a park, a roadside, a prairie, basically anywhere that milkweed grows. And every week they give us a description or every year they give us a description of the site, which tells us about the where it is, what kind of site it is, what kind of milkweed plants grow there. And then every week they go out and monitor for monarchs. Um, they look for the eggs and the caterpillars. And here's a picture of all the different sizes of the caterpillars that they look for. Um, here's somebody finding a great big fat monarch caterpillar on a leaf. You can see where the monarch has been eating right there. Um, this is a great project for kids. It's actually nice. They don't have to bend over so much. So they're out reporting the monarchs that they see to us. Um, we also, if you are on vacation, if, you, if you're a regular monitor, or you just want to try it out, you can give us reports of your monarchs from non-site. So you don't have to set up an, an official site. You can just log on to the website and say, I looked at some milkweed plants and I saw some monarch caterpillars or, or eggs. So it's a great project. Um, we have lots of volunteers all over the country. Um, here you can see a map of where we have sites. And just because there are a lot of dots on the map doesn't mean we don't need more people doing this. Um, it's over a thousand sites that have been monitored. We started this project in 1997. And the first year we had 25 sites and it's kind of exciting that six of these sites are still being monitored all these many years later. Okay, so I'm gonna see, it looks like we have a, one, one question in there. Um, if you have a question for me about anything I've talked about, um, type it in the Q&A box and Grace will ask it. Um, and if you don't, we'll just move on. I see there's just one there right now. Um, yes, and actually it's a question that I also had. Um, Janet asks, um, um, how do you tag monarchs? And I was going to ask if you can put teeny tiny tracking devices on them. Yeah, so I should have included a picture of a monarch tag. So if you look at your little fingernail, 
Um, a monarch tag is about the size of your little fingernail and it's just a sticker and it has a unique number on it. And the sticker goes right here. This is called the discal cell, this area between these veins. It looks almost like a mitten or almost like an upside down Wisconsin, really um, elongated. That, that sticker is put right here and it has a number on it. And then if people, then you record where and when you tag that monarch. Um, and then if somebody finds that monarch later on, there will be a record of where the tag was put on. So that, that's how they tag them. Um, the tags are very small and light. They don't impede the flight of the monarch at all. There are some tracking devices that we're using, but you can imagine that that's a very complicated technology. Um, the monarchs themselves weigh half a gram, and that's about as much as a paper clip, a small paper clip. So to find something, to engineer something that's light enough to fit or to not be hard for monarchs to carry is, is just kind of developing now. We, we really don't have that technology down yet, but I'm sure that it's coming. Very cool. I wanted to ask a couple questions about, um, about the migration. Um, how about how many miles can a day can monarchs cover and what altitude are they flying at? Yeah, so they can cover on average, and we don't, we can't track an individual monarch. Um, so we do that sort of averaging out how far they fly and, and how much time it takes them. So on average, they're flying about 50 miles a day. Um, but that's going to vary a lot depending on the wind. So if they, they'll get a tailwind and you ask about altitude, they're really smart about altitude. If, it's, uh, if there's a wind coming from the south, they'll stay really close to the ground where the wind isn't so strong. Um, if there's a tailwind, if the wind is coming from the north, they'll, they'll find the distance above the ground where the wind is most advantageous. So they're, they're, they're way up in the air on, on the right kinds of days. And we know this because there was a hang glider, a guy who was a hang glider pilot who studied monarchs. Um, name, his name was David Gibault. And he, he saw monarchs over a kilometer above the surface of the earth. So they will fly much higher than we can see them. Um, it's, it's pretty cool that they do that. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, and then we have, oh, we have a couple more questions uh, that came in. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, someone wants to know why do monarchs cluster together? Is it for warmth or safety? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, and the short answer is we don't know. And we have tried to study that. Um, in Mexico, there is some thermal. So if we talk about the clusters in Mexico, there is some thermal advantage to them being all together and it sometimes gets really cold. So we think that, and also there's certainly um, kind of a safety and numbers thing. There are predators there and you know, if you're a monarch that's one of a million, the chances of you getting eaten, you being the one eaten by that oriole that comes along, um, are much smaller than if you're um, in a, you know, this huge, this huge mass is a lot better than just being all by yourself. So there is some, some advantage to being in a cluster, both probably warmth and safety. And we don't know as they're migrating south. Um, what kinds of advantages, because there aren't as many birds that will eat them here. So we're, we're, you know, a lot of people have tried to figure that out, but we don't know the answer as they're migrating. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, do um, Sue wants to know, do monarchs use cultivars of milkweed as well as native, native milkweed? All the hundred species of milkweed that you mentioned? Yes, they will use cultivars. Um, there aren't that many. So people have, there are cultivars of butterfly weed. People have selected butterfly weed for the flower color. So there are some you can buy that the flowers are more yellow than orange. And they've also selected um, swamp milkweed for flower color, but they seem to have not messed with the chemistry of the leaves. So sometimes with when for nectar, when people select 
um, flowers for the, the way the flower looks. Um, it sometimes changes the quality or quantity of nectar, but the, they seem to be able to use the cultivars of milkweed just as well as the, the native, um, the progenitors of those cultivars. Okay. Good question. Great, thanks. Um, someone else says, and the question's are really coming up. Um, um, I have carefully preserved a patch of milkweed in my garden all summer. Is there any benefit to monarchs to keep the milkweed over the winter or may I cut it down now? Great question. There's no benefit to monarchs. Um, they're gone. By the time your milkweed, by the time winter comes, there are no monarchs. If, if they're in Wisconsin in the winter, they're dead. Um, so it doesn't matter to the monarchs. There are bees that will sometimes, um, what we call stem nesting bees that will use the stems. So in general, it's good to leave plants in your garden, um, all species, not just milkweed, during the winter because of their, the use of, of these stems by native bees. But for the monarchs, it doesn't matter a bit. Yeah. Okay. Is there a um, website that shows how the migration is coming along? Yeah, so Journey North, journeynorth.org. Um, you can go to that website. That's where I showed you those maps. So those maps are what we have to show you how the migration is coming along. It's just journeynorth.org. You can click on maps and there's a whole bunch of maps there, but you look for the monarch roost sites and you'll get the map that I showed you, the exact same one. Those maps were really cool. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Sarah would like to know, um, do they communicate in flight? We don't know. Um, probably not. They're certainly not communicating um, with sound and whether they find each other if they're, um, you know, looking for other monarchs, we really don't know um, if they are, but probably not. It's pro they're probably doing this migration, unlike birds who do form flocks um, deliberately. Um, monarchs, monarchs aren't, they're probably just doing the flight as, as individuals and not looking for each other. Until they're ready to settle down for the night. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then uh, Merle wonders if um, what what the average lifespan of monarch is. But you did talk about a little bit, but maybe yeah. You'd like to, yeah. So, so and, and is, six, that, is that different from other butterflies? Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. It's two to six weeks in the summer. The ones that don't migrate, and the ones that do migrate are six to eight months. So the ones that do migrate live a lot longer, but they don't reproduce until the end of that long lifespan. And butterfly lifespans are all across the board. Um, there are butterflies that only live several days. Um, there are some butterflies that live more than a year. So the lifespans really vary a lot. And monarchs, on average, if we compare monarchs to all other butterflies, they're on the long end of the lifespan. So they're there are relatively long-lived monarchs, but there are some tropical butterflies in the genus Heliconius that live even longer. They all live many months. And what's interesting is those long-lived butterflies, the tropical ones, actually consume nectar. Um, most, most butterflies just eat the, or excuse me, they consume pollen. Most butterflies just eat the nectar, which is basically just soda pop kind of, it's just sugar water, um, but the pollen has protein in it. So the butterflies that live the longest eat protein. Great question. I think we should probably move on, Grace. Um, and actually the, the last two questions, we can keep them, I see them up here, but those will go with the conservation. So hopefully we'll have time to get them, but I wanna make sure we get to the rest of the talk. So thank you for all of your wonderful questions. Um, it's really fun, you, you had great questions. So what we're gonna do now is move on to the conservation part of the talk. And I'm just gonna start by saying that monarch numbers are declining. Um, people care a lot, people are really concerned about monarchs but their numbers are going down. And remember that I told you that in for this Eastern migratory population, we measure monarchs by hectares. Um, and this is the area that they occupy in Mexico in hectares. And just a reminder that a hectare is about two and a half acres. So people go to, go to these overwintering sites, people that live in Mexico, measure the area 
that's occupied by trees covered with monarchs or with monarchs in them. And here you can see um, we've been doing this since 1993. And these are what the numbers have been. And you can see there is a ton of up and down. The monarchs, you know, they can go, if we look at 2003 compared to 2004, that's a decline of about 75% in one year. Um, but behind that up and down trend is a long-term downward trend. And what I like to do is look at these numbers in 10-year averages. So for the last 10 years, the average area in Mexico has been 2.6 hectares for the 10, and it's been holding pretty steady, certainly up and downs. We had one really great year in the winter of 2018, 2019, but so it's been holding steady for the last decade, but it's lower than it was the decade before that where the average was about 5.2. There's a lot of change in this decade. Um, from 2002 to 20, 2011, a lot of downward in that decade. And then the decade before that, the average was about 8.7. So there's this long-term downward trend in monarch numbers. And I don't really have time to go into all of the reasons for this, but we've, we have studied that in great detail because we have all of these years of data right now. So we can really look at what factors are associated with these high years and what factors are associated with these low years. And what we know is that the amount of habitat that's available to them up here in their breeding grounds, um, the declining amount of habitat available and hot weather are associated with lower monarch numbers. So it's habitat and weather that are are driving or that we say are, are the, the forces behind causing these this variation in monarch numbers. So when we understand this, um, we can start thinking about what we can do to stop the decline in monarch numbers. Now, we know that weather is changing and we know that this a lot of this is human driven climate change. So mitigating climate change is a big one. And I'm not gonna talk on that tonight, but um, you know, just th that's gotta be acknowledged right away that, that we need to do something about mitigating climate change or monarchs won't have a very good chance as will many other organisms. Um, but we can think about habitat. Um, and the way I like to think about habitat is where are the opportunities to add more habitat? So there's been a long-term decline in monarch habitat, but where can we put some back in? And one place is in urban and suburban spaces. And this was my yard when I lived in Minnesota. Um, my yard now in, in Madison is really shady. So I'm just learning how to garden in the shade, but I had lots and lots of monarchs. So this picture was taken in my garden. Um, there were a lot of monarchs that used this garden, use the milkweed, use the flowers. So urban and suburban spaces are, are great opportunities. Unfortunately, this is what a lot of urban and suburban spaces look like. And this picture was taken in Michigan, but this could be Wisconsin, Illinois, Idaho, um, Iowa, Indiana. Um, this is basically habitat for nothing. Um, this is an invasive grass. This is Kentucky bluegrass. It doesn't even belong in Wisconsin. It's not native. Um, and we maintain these lawns and we actively try to keep other species out of them. So this is, this is what we should not be doing, um, is, is maintaining, putting all the water and chemicals and gas in our lawnmowers into maintaining these green lawns that are, habit, are not habitat for anything. So that's one place to start is, is taking out as much lawn as we can and putting back real habitat. Another opportunity is agricultural set aside land. And this is land that was farmed and now it's being changed. We've been pulling it out of agriculture and putting it into habitat. 
So this picture is a cornfield. This picture was taken in Iowa. And this is a prairie strip. Here's the corn over here. So this is a prairie put in in between the rows of cornfields. And it's so it's set aside. That means it's it's set aside for nature. So that's another opportunity is taking some land out of production. Um, another great opportunity is rights of ways. And these are often linear habitats that allow monarchs and other species kind of a way to get from one big habitat to another one. This picture was taken along Highway 35 in Southern um, Minnesota. Um, you obviously don't want the habitat right next to the road. That's not safe for drivers. Um, it also gets mowed. So it's wouldn't be good habitat, but there's a lot of opportunity. This can be along roadsides, railroad rights of ways, utility lines, like big electric lines. There's a lot of habitat under those that we could use for monarchs and lots of other species. And again, we have to think about the mowing that needs to occur. So we shouldn't be planting the milkweed right next to the road because it's just going to get mowed, um, killing whatever monarchs are on it. Another opportunity is land that's already protected. So this is a grassland that's managed or owned and managed by the by us, the taxpayers, um, US Forest Service land. So this is a national grasslands area in South Dakota. So there is a lot of land that's already protected that we can do something about, that we can make it better habitat for monarchs and other species. And finally, there's what we call marginal agricultural land. So this picture was taken in Southern Wisconsin. Um, this you can tell because you're from Wisconsin, you know, this is a cornfield. Um, this is a cornfield that flooded, it floods most years. Um, so there are only a few years that it's actually productive. And if we pulled some of this marginal land out of production and put it back into native habitat, that would give us a lot more habitat for monarchs and a lot of other species. So there's lots of opportunities out there to create more habitat for monarchs. And then what can you do as an individual? I mean, you might not be a farmer, you might not have access to a lot of land, um, but there are things that we as individuals can do. We can create habitat. Um, it doesn't have to be habitat that we can we own. Um, we can help out at a local nature center, maybe your local library has some land. Um, anywhere there's lawn, we can we can create habitat there. And, you know, you can do what I did pretty easily in my front yard in Minnesota, and I'm doing here in, in Madison. You can contribute to Monarch Citizen Science. Um, join Journey North. You can look at those maps, and then you can see your first monarch or see a roost and report to that. Um, join the MLMP Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Many ways to contribute to Monarch Citizen Science. You can support conservation organizations. So any organization that um, is raising funds to support habitat conservation needs, needs our, our money and our support. These can be big organizations that are nationwide, like the Nature Conservancy, the Wisconsin chapter of the Nature Conservancy, your local um, nature center, any organization that's um, supporting habitat. Um, Needs, needs our money and our support. Um, after you hear me talk for an hour, you will be a Monarch expert. Um, you can spread the word. You can tell your friends and neighbors about Monarch conservation because it's really going to take all of us working together. Um, and then you can do what you can to mitigate climate change, um, decrease your own carbon footprint on the earth. Um, so I'm going to just for a couple minutes here at the end, and I, I see I do have a couple minutes and I'll this will just take me some time. But now that I'm the director of the UW-Madison Arboretum, um, I think a lot about what the Arboretum is doing for conservation of, of a lot of species. Um, and this is a talk given by or a short excerpt from a talk given by Ola Leopold in 1934 when the Arboretum was dedicated. Um, and he said, this is the function of the Arboretum. It's a reconstructed sample of old Wisconsin to serve as a benchmark, a starting point in the long and laborious job of building a permanent and mutually beneficial relationship 
between people and the land. So that is what we're all about. And that's what we need to do is bring ourselves back into better connection with the land. Um, I hope that you all come visit us. Um, you could maybe mention in the chat if you've ever been to the Arboretum. Um, we have lots of habitat here. We're 1,200 acres in Madison. Here's a map and here's kind of a bird's eye view. There's downtown Madison. In the background, this is Lake Wingra and Lake Monona over here. Um, we're, we are smack dab in the middle. Uh, this is the belt line going through. We've got some land south of the belt line, some land north of the belt line, but it's 1200 acres and a lot of great monarch habitat there. Um, we also have some outlying properties, over 500 acres, mostly in Southern Wisconsin, but one up near Minocqua. Up here are varying sizes of these um, parcels. These are mostly remnant parcels, so they've never been plowed, never been farmed. And this is land that we're managing also, owned by the university, managed by the Arboretum. Um, and I think really importantly, the Arboretum is really the birthplace of the field of restoration ecology. So if you've ever worked on restoring any land, a prairie or anything else, that got its start at the UW-Madison Arboretum. We have the first restored prairie in the world, Curtis Prairie, which is right outside my office window. Um, native plants were first put in there in 1936 in 60 acres um, of what had been just overgrazed pasture land. Um, we have, so we have the first restored prairie, Curtis Prairie, and then we have what we think is the third restored prairie. Um, what's called Green Prairie, which is south of the Beltline. So it really is the birthplace of this whole field of, of bringing back that relationship between people and the land. So, you know, sometimes I get asked about why do we care? Um, you know, why does it matter? What does everything we're doing really make a difference? And whether we care about monarchs themselves or not, I really do think that what we do for monarchs will, will be worthwhile because monarchs exist in this really interesting mosaic of rare and pristine habitat like um, prairie remnants that are about the most rare habitat out there, but also common and disturbed habitats. You can see a milkweed plant growing out of a crack in a sidewalk and a monarch can find and use that milkweed plant. Um, and these habitats are shared with lots of other species. Hopefully um, you would agree with me that they're a really interesting organism. And because you asked me questions that we still don't know the answer to, we can learn a lot about the natural world from monarchs by continuing to study them. And they have this migration um, that is an unmatched biological phenomenon. There are other butterflies and other insects that migrate, but none in such a regular um, and kind of repeatable and predictable pattern as monarchs do. So they have this incredible, incredible migration that's just predictable every single year. It's like clockwork. So my goal is to make sure that is still happening for my grandchildren, which I'm starting to have right now. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what I hope happens because of what we're doing right now. So I'm gonna stop again and I see some more questions coming in and, and we'll have some time to answer them. And I'll leave this slide up for a couple minutes just in case you wanna email, you don't get your question answered. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanna, before we get on to the next batch of questions, I wanna give a shout out to the Friends of the Green Bay Trail who um, are really doing their part here in the northern suburbs of Chicago to, to expand habitat along this, this stretch from um, the, the, the they, they take care of the trail from um, uh, Glen, Glencoe down as far as Wilmette. And um, uh, they've planted a ton of habitat and, in, and lots of milkweed, of course. And they even have a hatchery um, at about the halfway point. Um, and, Kids Great, and I want to apologize because I've been saying all along Green Bay, but you're not in Green Bay. So I'm really sorry for that. 
No problem. That's embarrassing, um, but I gave a yeah. talk for Green Bay and I was just kind of mixed up here tonight, but. It, Green Bay Trail sounds like it should be in Green Bay, but it, yeah, it goes to Green Bay. So don't right. worry about that. Um, okay. I just want you to know. Um, um, and then, um, so so yeah, the, I mean, the friends have really done a lot for, for um, monarchs around here. And then also I wanted to mention to people in Glencoe that um, there have been the sustainability task force has planted um, a lot of um, native plants along the side of village hall. And um, I just noticed them recently and I don't know how long they've been there, but they look beautiful and they're it's another little piece of things. So, um, so we're trying and we're gonna keep trying. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, how did you end up so focused on monarchs? Well, you know, I when I first started studying monarchs, I was interested in insect reproduction. And it's before monarchs were even in danger. It was in the 1980s. Um, and I, I didn't think so much about conservation at first. Um, I, I just was really interested in insect reproduction and studied monarchs for kind of practical reasons because they were pretty easy to raise, um, were very common. So it was pretty practical and, and I spent, I did my PhD on monarchs studying their reproduction and probably the first, um, oh, like six or seven years after that. And then as the numbers were declining and as my own career was evolving, I was having graduate students who had broader interest in monarchs. Gradually, we kind of shifted over to focusing on monarch conservation very broadly. But um, I started out, yeah, just really interested in how many eggs they laid and um, how many times they mated and those kinds of questions. I've, I've got an egg question for you right here. Uh, All right. Jane asks, um, how do you stop ants from taking the eggs off milkweed plants? Yeah, so I didn't really go into all the things that eat monarchs, but it sounds like Joan knows that egg, mo ants eat a lot of monarch eggs and caterpillars. Um, ants, um, stink bugs, mites, spiders, um, a whole bunch of other kinds of bugs, beetles, the, the Asian ladybird beetles, the multicolored Asian ladybugs, and other ladybugs as well. So it, there are lots of things that eat monarchs. And on average, probably about two out of 100 survive to become an adult. Um, so there's very high mortality and ants are one of the things that are out there. And there's really nothing we can do about that because if we sprayed an insecticide, that would kill the monarchs as well. Um, a female can lay 500 eggs in her lifetime. So if two of those survive or 10 of those survive, um, she's, that population is growing. You know, you know how fast the human population would grow if we all had 10 children that survived. So um, that you know, it's a natural thing. The ants are out there eating them and there really isn't anything we can do about that. Just know that it's part of the natural natural cycle of things. Okay. Um, it, somebody else that wants to know is, um, is raising monarchs by humans doing good or not? Um, so great question. If, if I, like I'm sitting in my dining room right now and my kitchen is right there. And um, I'm raising, I raise about 20 monarchs every year sitting on my kitchen table. I have five monarch pupae and one that's still a caterpillar. I love raising them. Um, I don't raise a lot and I don't do it because I think I'm saving the monarch population by doing it. I do it very carefully. Every monarch is in its own little container. Um, but I, so it, it so it, it's all a matter of scale. So I do not recommend buying monarchs, um, raising them on mass scale and selling them, which some companies do, can do harm because there can be the genetic changes that if you raise them generation after generation, they evolve, they, they get adapted to being raised in captivity. But Collecting a monarch egg or caterpillar from your yard and bringing it in, as long as you expose it to natural light conditions, um, don't keep it, keep the lights on it all the time. And it's getting the signals from outside about how long the day length is. It, it doesn't really hurt, um, but you shouldn't do it because you want to help save, save the monarch population because we'll never rear enough monarchs to to 
you know, build the population back up. Um, and if we rear a lot of monarchs and release them out into a world where there's no habitat, it really won't make a difference. So um, it doesn't do harm, but, and it will save the life on average. It'll save the life of those individuals that you bring in because 97, 98% of them will die. Um, so it's, but you, you know, that's a, there's a whole spectrum of opinions on that. I just told you mine. I'm, I tend to be kind of a middle of the road type of person. Um, so, you know, take that for what it's worth. And, you know, I will be the first to say that I love raising monarchs and many other kinds of caterpillars as well. That's lovely. Um, I wanted to ask you a question um, on my own, of my own, and that is that uh, monarchs were placed in, in July 2020 sorry, in July of this year, monarchs were placed on the endangered list. Um, what does that mean for them? Do they get extra protections or extra attention or does it really just, is yeah. it the red flag saying, hey, this is a problem? It raises a red flag. So there are two different lists. Um, they were placed on what's called the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And that, like it sounds, is an international body whose goal is to evaluate as many species as possible and just kind of help us understand how many species in the world are at risk of extinction. So it's a completely sort of non-biased um, assessment of how different populations are doing. And they've evaluated thousands of species. And this year, they evaluated monarchs or last year. Um, so, and I was involved, I helped review that assessment. So it's, it's not, it, it's a, just a scientific thing. It, it doesn't carry any protection. It doesn't mean that we, you know, will be obligated to do anything to protect monarchs because this is an international body. There, there also was an attempt by some groups to list them by the Fish and Wildlife Service under the to give them legal protection under the Endangered Species Act in the United States, which would have had legal teeth, so to say. Um, so that that would have been different. But the IUCN listing, and that was there was a petition to do that, and the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that they warranted listing. But the, the listing was precluded because there are so many species that are even worse off. So if that would have happened, it would have meant legal protection. But the listing that did happen doesn't, it's, it's just kind of a red flag, like you said. Well, maybe it'll help focus some attention anyway. That's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, and then uh, just a couple more questions. Um, Linda says she has a lot of common milkweed pods. What can she do with them? So there are quite a few groups. So um, I'm not sure where you are, but the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service collects milkweed pods. There are a lot of groups here in Madison, the Audubon Society, um, some other local nature centers. So you might ask a local nature center if they're interested. I know they would be a lot more interested if you clean the seeds, if you took the fluff off of those milkweed seeds, um, because it's actually kind of hard. Um, I've done that a lot and you come out just like covered with fluff. So, you know, they would be happier to get the seeds from you than the pods, because if you give them the pods, they've got a lot more work to do. But I think you might be able to find a nature center. And you can look online for ways to clean the seed. There are many different opinions on how to do that, um, ranging from spinners to fire to doing it with your fingers, um, lots of ways to do that. Um, I hope I'm correct in saying it. I know that last year, anyway, the Friends of Green Bay Trail had a seed cleaning um, party, or a series of them, actually, sitting in somebody's garage. Good. Um, they may be doing that again this year. So if you like the idea of picking fluff, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I do, <laughs> um, it would be um, it would be a fun way and a helpful thing to do. Um, finally, a um, oh, couple more, two more questions. Um, oh, Eileen asks about the seeds. Why do you have to clean the seeds? Nature doesn't. 
Great question. Um, you're right, nature doesn't end that fluff on the milkweed seed is nature's way or the milkweed seeds way of, of moving it into a new environment. But um, if you put, so when people plant the milkweed seed, they often mix that milkweed seed in with a lot of other prairie seeds and the fluff just makes it harder to handle. Um, if you've ever worked with it, if you're out trying to plant milkweed seeds and the fluff is still on them, it'll, they'll just blow away and not go where you want them to go. So it's, it's just easier to plant them if the fluff has been removed. So what would happen in nature is they would blow a ways and then they'd land on the ground and that fluff would just break off naturally. But it's just because of the way that we do restorations that we want them cleaned off. I love that question. <laughs> good question. Yeah. yeah, it was good. Um, yeah. Okay, and finally, um, Ronald asks, um, he says he, has four, he had four caterpillars on his milkweed last week. Do they have a chance of making it south? Yes, they have a chance. Their chance is lower. So my last caterpillar that I'm raising right now is going to pupate tomorrow or the next day. Um, so it'll be an adult butterfly in early October. Um, and I know that it has a lower chance of making it south. Um, the ones leaving now for various reasons. For one thing, it's going to be warmer so they can fly better when it's warmer. Um, and there will be more nectar available to them. If you've looked out in a prairie recently, the flowers are starting to get old and there aren't as many flowers available and there really won't, won't be in a couple of weeks. So they have a chance, but the chance is less than if they were an adult right now heading south. Go caterpillars, go. Go, right? <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Overheiser. This is delightful, informative, and um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your enthusiasm on this important subject. And finally, thanks again to the Friends of the Green Bay Trail for their continued partnership in offering environmental programs. Uh, we, we've had this lovely, long um, programming relationship with them, and it's, it's yielded some wonderful things. So um, that being said, um, good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. It was really fun. Good questions. <laughs>